Hey. Hey. <laughs> I love how we're matching blazers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of perfect. We did not coordinate. Um, Just so, talking a lot together these days. <laughs> so I always like to start these off by giving a really long intro. Everyone I invite up here to be a guest speaker is someone I truly respect and truly admire and with how they present themselves, how they have moved in their career and just about everything. So I want you guys to see through my lens of what I see of Diana. Um, so Diana is the Partnerships and Community Lead at Form Labs, which by the way, we'll get into a little bit later, is a position she created and it did not exist before she got to Form Labs. Form Labs is a really big, really big company. It's considered the Apple of 3D printing, not even kidding. And also with her twin sister, she started a company called Himela Design, and they design 3D printed jewelry. And they've been doing that for quite some time as well. Uh, I Again, I highly respect Diana. Uh, we actually met at a Rapid in Texas in 2017 by going to a women in 3D printing event that I found out a few hours before it happened. I was Same. reluctant. <laughs> on the floor, I was talking to someone, I was like, they're like, you should go. And I was like, okay, I'm kind of tired from walking all day, but okay. We were both a little reluctant to go. We, we met, she actually came up to me and we started talking for about like 45 minutes, which at a networking event is a long time. And we really hit it off. And ever since then we've been, Make Lab and Form Labs have been collaborating and I'm so glad I went. Um, Diana is one of the most kind compassionate, giving humans I have ever met in this industry. Like, I'm not, I'm not even meaning to make you blush. <laughs> it's just like really what I think. Um, and I'm so honored to have her here today. I'm honored to be here, <laughs> Christina, seriously. <laughs> okay, so I wanna start this out by inviting the audience to do a little bit of interaction, like, like I mentioned in the intro. So there's no, in all of our generation, there was no education in 3D printing. The reason why we all have start, like picked, up a, picked up 3D printing or 3D modeling is by our own volition. Like we've all done YouTube, we've all looked on the forums, we've all looked, I don't know, gone to a conference and asked a ton of questions that were super beginner level. Um, so I wanna know, and write on your first card with your Sharpie, how, like, what does community mean to you? Um, how has it really played into your development in the 3D printing industry? Um, just jot down a few words, one or two, quick, um, and I'll give you a minute here. So like I mentioned before, community is a super vague word, uh, especially in an, in an industry that people are just beginning to adopt. Uh, it's not really well defined. It can be confused with the word networking, which feels very cold. It feels very robotic. It feels very like a hard sell. It doesn't feel warm and welcoming. So Diana, what does community mean to you? Such a big word. <laughs> um, I got really scared of the word um, about a year ago when it was added to my title and my team. I was just partnerships and then we were it turned out that I was doing community stuff, and my boss said, what about if we expand this to partnerships and community? And I was like, I don't know anything about community. Why would I? <laughs> and then I started to think about stuff, and I started to think about the stuff, the, the path that I came from. Um, I was born with a community. My twin sister in the hat right here, um, <laughs> we, we, I was literally created with a community. And um, I think that a, a community, well, it could, I mean, to be a little meta, it's really within yourself, but it's really about connecting with other people, and I think it's two, it's not three, it, it can begin with two people. A partnership is a community, and, um, and it's about give and take. It's about um, generosity, and Christina, it was really, it came up when we were talking about this the other day, that it's, it's a generosity, and it's a, you have to come giving stuff, but also to be vulnerable to receive stuff, and, and so that's what community really means. Um, and then trying to think succinctly about it, I recognize that um, it's a chemical reaction. It's one thing plus another thing yielding something different. And you can't deconstruct that. And 
getting nerdy and relevant to the topic of 3D printing, that's how I always differentiate form labs from an FTM company to recognize that you can't, unfortunately our materials are not recyclable, but also it yields this like higher, um, you know, like more, you could say, a, a powerful uh, production part that you can use because it's more durable or more tough or something and you can't deconstruct that and you can't take it away. So going back to community, it's one, X plus Y yields Z, and you can't get back to X and Y. A new thing is created. Um, and then to reference, yesterday I had totally fangirled. I was in Boston, um, where Form Labs is. I went to a women's convention, and Brene Brown spoke. Anyone know Brene Brown? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's my self-help fairy godmother. And um, she was talking about community and the importance of how... Actually, she showed a video of her and her sisters dancing wildly to um, in a concert of um, Garth Brooks. And she said, I would have never done that with lights on by myself. But we did that in the form of, uh, with a bunch of people together. And that was the magic that was created when one plus two plus three comes together and yields 100. Yeah. So chemical reaction. <laughs> it totally is. And I think too, like, when thinking about community with business, like you're often thinking about the end goal. Like how will it benefit me? But oftentimes I find in these happy hours that I host every single month, there are some months we don't talk at all about 3D printing. We talk about hot topics, like we talk about Elon Musk, the Cybertruck, how ridiculous it is. We talk about, I don't know, Adam Newman, his craziness. You know, we'll talk about... Can't get away from that. <laughs> <laughs> Literally cannot. Um, you know, we'll talk about all these random things, but it doesn't always have to be about the end goal, because at the end of the day, it's relationship building. And yeah, it's about no, it's about experiment. Like. Yeah. The catalyst is coming together, and you don't know what the product is going to be also. Sometimes it's a dud. Sometimes it sucks. Sometimes you should <laughs> try to <laughs> deconstruct it somehow. But usually something surprising happens that in a good way. Like, you learn something from it. Yeah. And it takes that vulnerability and that patience to kind of see where the road takes you. That's where you really, you know, enjoy the fruits of your labor. And you really understand how it connects to both of your end goals. And that's kind of the beauty of it, the vulnerability of not knowing. Um, so that being said, I have another audience question. So community is a very much like a feeling thing. How do you measure it? We're, we're all involved with businesses. We all work for someone or we have our own business. How do you measure community? So jot down on your second post-it that we will be putting up on the wall, just one or two words about how you measure the success of community. Bringing the question back to you, you work for Form Labs, which is a pretty large company. Um, I don't know how how long have you guys been around for? About eight years. Yeah. So Form Labs is, um, we have offices in headquartered in Boston, Somerville, Massachusetts, Berlin, uh, Shenzhen, Tokyo, and Singapore, and then a bunch of reseller partners to spread the word outside of the markets that we have uh, teams in. We're about 650 employees. Um, we've sold over, let's say, 60,000 printers now, which is more than um, any other professional 3D printer company because of the price point um, wow. and usability. And um, yeah, so we're, we have a long way to go. The world is big, but high growth. <laughs> That's like incredible to me because being a business owner like three years in, to think where I'd be at at five years, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm pretty sure that uh, Natan and Max. I, I don't know what their thoughts were at the three at the three year mark, but it, that's incredible. Um, but being part of such a large organization with such a far reach, like how do you, how do you measure community? That's such a good question because we have investors and we have a board and we have um, marketing gets really translated to leads and sales. There's dollars and it's I do stuff that could influence it, it. All influences leads and all influences dollars, but it's not always traceable and sometimes the most authentic interactions an Instagram reach out is not a lead generation I didn't think that Jocelyn was going to buy another leader of resin or a printer when I reached out to you on Instagram I just loved your stuff and I wanted to talk to you <laughs> <laughs> and I was timid to do so too <laughs> but um so numbers matter and but 
we know the importance of it and we knew the authenticity of like Form Labs launched on a Kickstarter campaign and the goal was like uh, 300,000 or what was it? Three, uh, $100,000 and we hit close to $3 million. It was the biggest campaign of time. And it was because of word of mouth and people were really supporting the, the, the company. And so back to Form Labs, we were now we had a community growing the whole time, and so I realized that I was like acquiring the formality of a, of a community at the time, but we still didn't know how to measure it. De we definitely consider that voting by dollars means something, that when they can buy something, we're unlocking something that, the access, unlocking access to something they could have done, couldn't have done before, and so if they're buying something, that means it's working. But beyond that, bigger than the 50,000 or 60,000 people who have bought a printer, we look at, is it followers? Is it forum comments? Is it engagement? But we've actually whittled it down to a boiled it down to a, a symptom, which is user generated content or UGC in marketing speak. And this is brand new. It's like in the last six months that we said, okay, user generated content means like people like Jocelyn who are posting and Christina who are posting about the way that they're using the printer and the applications, not because I mean with the informalities of an ambassador program, we definitely um, <laughs> ask them if they'd like to, but it's not, and there's no contracts, and it's just um, beyond you guys, there's a lot of people also sharing what they do, and that's a symptom of engagement and happiness, and something's working. That's so good, because um, you hear other brands talk about it. You hear that a lot in the beauty industry. They talk about user-generated content. How, I mean, Kylie Jenner, you know what I mean? Enough said. Um, but it's interesting to see a brand really take that to the next level and use those tactics and really take one and measure success in that way because you don't see a lot of people doing it. And it's really hard. Like you, you can put on receipts, you can put on invoices like tag us, you'll get a discount or blah, 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 blah. Um, but it, it takes a lot for someone to actually take the time to... Instagram something, share it on their story, go through the whole tagging thing, find your company, you know, and press send. It, seem, it seems so simple, but it's really difficult. And I see you guys post it every single week, and it's incredible. That's yeah, and right now we're even, like, still the, the culture is afraid to, like, ask people to do things because they want it to be, like, very authentic. Mm -hmm. And so we just... We, ju we just hoard it and share it. And then like as a celebration, we share it. We, you know, and then we create a conference to share those things. And we share people's parts when we can in person and stuff like that. But we could even be much more, um, we could optimize our strategy a lot more to like ask for that and incentivize. But, and we probably will work, work towards that because that's what we want the outcome to be. But um, for now, it's been very authentic. Yeah. That's truly amazing. And you guys have such a like large following count that I'm sure anyone would be beyond happy to be featured on Form Labs Instagram stories. Like I mean, celebrating community then means, you know, putting it back out to the people and not talking about our own stuff when we don't need to is that it's the giving part. And right. because we also get really excited about it. Right. That's amazing. So bringing it back to a little bit more of a personal question, uh, what why is community important to you and why do you think it's important to the 3D printing industry? Yeah, um, there was one word that came up. I was talking about this and thinking this through um, with Julie, and it's kind of dark word, isolation. It's one where you feel vulnerable, but in the wrong way. <laughs> it's in the way that you feel lonely. Um, I feel like New Yorkers feel this a lot in like an ironic way, because you're surrounded by people and you tend to feel lonely. But um, isolation is really the theme of what has been a tool of mine to build community and plug into community. And I'll tell a personal story, and then I'll go back to Form Labs. But um, uh, about 10 years ago, um, I was an engineer um, working in some factory floors, and it turned out I had a cough, turned serious really quickly, and actually I was diagnosed by it with lymphoma. And I had um, stage 3B, very advanced. I had to go rush back to, I was in Brazil at the time, and I went back to Detroit, where I was born and raised. And I was had like anywhere but here syndrome. I didn't want to be there at all. Um, and it was ironic that I was stuck there. And, and Julie um, stopped her job, also as an engineer, and came back with me. We isolated ourselves in order to combat a crazy disease that luckily I'm completely in remission. Everything is perfectly fine. But I went through the whole uh, journey. And um, that was really isolating. Like literally people would have to wear like face or like masks and stuff to, to, to be in the room and stuff like that. So you're in a white room 
what's going on. I wanted to, I lived in Germany and Brazil and Turkey and, and other parts of the US and I didn't want to be back there again. And we were like, we're feeling so disconnected from the world, let alone our friends. So, but and we wanted to connect with um, actually other cancer patients who were also suffering in a way of like, from a youth perspective, I was 25 at the time. So we started making, we started making jewelry and telling stories about, inspired by each city that we lived in and um, telling that story. And first we put it on, um, our cousin was selling on Etsy, buttons, ugly buttons. She told us that it worked to sell her buttons. We're like, she can sell her buttons. We can sell her jewelry because nurses at the hospital were asking if our stuff was for sale. Julie was like in the corner making loads of necklaces for no reason. And um, so we put them on Etsy and posted them on Facebook when Facebook wasn't paid for and no ads and some like, person who didn't really like us in high school bought a necklace or like this is definitely a business I guess yeah. and so but anyways we were telling our story of each of the cities that we went to and through that we were in Detroit and connecting with we connected to other businesses one was a, a, a cancer nonprofit donating um, actually pain pills of cancer patients and um, and fashion as well but we were connecting to that community and connecting back to our friends and the and actually a new community to us design which we no business in being in through this creation of product. It was actually just an excuse to connect to people because we were isolated. And that was this weird aha moment, like, whoa, we can, if we're telling, if we're vulnerable, we're telling a story of, well, it was design. People didn't know why I was wearing a scarf on my head. Um, but it was sharing a story and people relating. Is it like, oh, Paris, I've been there and I love that necklace, cool. Or, you know, they like it for the design, they, they identified it. That, that Venn diagram again, they identified um, there was a center point if it was because maybe a story of sisters even, but it was really about the design piece or the story behind the piece. So that was one um, small aha moment when we realized that isolation could be cured by creating something and, and connecting to people by something you create, which obviously relates to 3D printing and why we're also here all today, today together. Um, the 3D printing side, I became fascinated by 3D printing when I was in Berlin working there after my MBA. I went to a, a fab lab and I scanned my head and printed it out on a wannabe maker bot in blue, like this big. And I thought, like, there's something here. It was about six years ago. I was like, wow, amazing. Um, I couldn't stop talking about it. I thought my brain was racing about what could be the possibilities based on like the manufacturing background I had and and um, my more like creative side of thinking about jewelry or photo booths and bars and stuff like that. And um, so it stuck with me. And I ended up moving back to New York a year later or so. It's still was talking nonsense about 3D printing. None of my friends, nobody knew about it. I was the crazy one and I was, like, <laughs> you could say the expert at the time, I knew nothing yeah. and I couldn't stop. And, and meanwhile, um, I got this job in marketing at an at a e-commerce weird <laughs> pet food subscription company <laughs> and to learn marketing and I was there but I still couldn't stop thinking about 3D printing and the passion of that. Um, Ultimately, Julie and I went back to our jewelry company. Um, but be actually, before that happened, our birthday came around. Julie bought me a replicator too, a maker bot, refurbished from the warehouse. And because I don't know why you did that, it's a big investment. It was bold. <laughs> She's like, this is your Christmas present and your birthday present, and it's a present for us. We're going to use it. And that was just amazing. I remember um, arriving to the maker bot offices somewhere in Brooklyn. Dark night, looked like this, cold outside, February, picked it up, and I had talked to a couple of the team members, and I remember carrying the box and being like, are you, sh like, do you have any manuals for this? And do you have any, there, there must be like a community website, or you have meetups and stuff because your, your HQ is here. They're like, no, go online, you can find it, and like, you'll find enough. I'm like, are you sure? I remember getting the cat taxi, and scared out of my mind that like I was so excited, heart racing, but totally freaked out that I was gonna mess up this the most valuable tool in my life and took it back to my apartment and it stayed in the box for a month. And I looked online and I was looking at forums and they all existed, but not my speed, not my speak. And 
I even went to one or two meetups. I remember walking, I, I went all the way across town. I don't remember where I was. I walked up to the window, saw the scope. It was, I'm usually used to being the only girl, but it was a couple guys, looked like they were in their mom's basement programming, a gaming, <laughs> and it was, I walked away. And that was like, I still kind of like, I'm hard on myself for that moment because I could have been like, you know, introduce myself and maybe they would have taught me the whole world of 3D printing, but it didn't fit. So eventually I opened the box um, and, and took, a, took their SD card preloaded with a file and printed an orange comb. Um, <laughs> everyone has a comb at home anyways. It's not custom, it's not special, I just printed it. But for 3D printing, we need to like recognize its production and its design. And design gets in the way a lot of the time, but it's really production too. So produce something, yay. And then that day I went to get my hair cut in the Lower East Side and the hair stylist pulled out an orange comb and she like combed my hair. And when I, it was like such a weird stark thing of like, I felt like, I was like, the comb is awesome, but everyone has a comb. But when she pulled out that comb, there was some like aha moment. I'm like, wait, I have a 3D printer. <laughs> I just printed that. She like couldn't even understand what that meant. Yeah. So, I mean, it was kind of, that was connection to people and, and things. I guess that was a 3D printing connection of things that just continued my motivation of Things matter, and I could make a better comb than if I get good at design. But it went back to uh, six years ago. MakerBot was the most advanced of the 3D printer companies, and they had nothing relevant for me. And I was starved for information. I paid for a Tinkercad class, and nobody pays for a Tinkercad class. <laughs> and we bought a 3D printer together, and nobody should have to buy a 3D printer to to be you know feel comfortable to use it. And so those that moment of isolation again is when I thought no one should have to go through the, like, the time. I can't consider that was, like, blissful this, at the same time, but also frustrating that, um, frustrating that we had to go through that journey in order to start connecting to people. Right. It was like pulling teeth and I felt isolated. So the isolation feeling then made me hungry to say, we went back to our jewelry company, we were doing that for a bit, but my fascination with 3D printing still just got stronger. And I said, F it, I need to work for a 3D printer company. And so Form Labs is where I landed to plug into their community. And then it's been another tool to expand to 3D printing again. So, so that fear, that fear and um, really feeling that isolation piece really like fueled the fire that everyone's talking about. Um, to, to figure it out and get, connect to people. It's interesting that you talk about your starter story because I had a similar experience. So when I was an undergrad at Pratt for industrial design, there was like a Stratus printer there in the laser cutter room and it was really tall, like almost, I think it was taller than me, I'm short. <laughs> and it was like, you know, two feet wide, two feet deep and then really tall. But the build volume was only like seven, <laughs> inches cubed and when I would go in the laser cutter room not only was it hot because you're like you're burning wood to like cut it but uh there were two of them but this thing would like just like shake <laughs> and you know like when you're when you're when it's printing infill like in a really thin wall and it just goes really fast yep. I think that's what was happening it would just shake and I was like terrified of it like and I was like nah I'm good like I I'm not I'm not gonna 3d print stuff like I don't even know how it works like uh, I'll pass. I'll just like laser cut everything and like put it together somehow or carve it out of clay or foam or something. Like I took the hard road. And then uh, Manny bought a 3D printer, my partner, my business partner, Manny. Um, and it was a printer bot and it was made out of wood and he tie dyed it. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> this doesn't make sense in my brain. But again, it was it was that lack of community, which meant that like lack of education about how to get started. So that means the barrier to entry was very very high. That means you know you had to be a, a specialist to operate a 3D printer. Whereas now, because there's so much community, much because of Form Labs too, um, it's a lot easier to get started. There's so many resources online. There's so many communities like Women in 3D Printing. There, there's Swug. There's FutureWorks. Like all these people know about 3D printing. Um, so that leads me to my next question. How has community shaped Form Labs culture, both mm. internally and externally? Like before you got the like before you were there versus like the work that you did. Yeah. Well, how about if you guys learned on your own about 3D printing, like informally? 
Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what we see in the job world when we're hiring people to grow our company of 650 people. Now, like, what blew my mind is that I hired an intern this year, and he ran a print farm, we call them, um, at Northeastern of Form 2s. And so he literally was obsessed with Form 2s before he came into Form Labs. And that, so he, and, but he said he learned himself how to use the printers, but there you go. You know, all of a sudden you have new access because of the makerspaces and education, of course. Um, but there's a bunch of people who've learned from their, on their own, and they call it like the wild, wild west, and everyone teaches themselves. So Form Labs has been formed out of curiosity, and that's why I love 3D printing, because it come, it, it attracts people who are just curious and pro problem solvers, but like vulnerable problem solvers. Like you're gonna mess up and make mistakes and usually the equipment is expensive. Even Form Labs, it's still 3,500 bucks just to, for the hardware. It's not like, it's not your lunch money. So you have to also share the experience too. And so you have to share with someone that you're vulnerable and that you're still like learning and understanding something. Um, so that's where Form Labs began. And certainly we got validated by all the people who put money into the Kickstarter and became our customers really fast, um, which turned our company, which turned our concept to a company. But um, it was built on curious people. And so we first started growing and our users were like our, like our employees. And little by little, we even had like, as we grew, I think at 100 people, I wasn't there yet, but they had a party called Keep Form Labs weird. <laughs> they thought it was really important to keep people to like, um, f like flying their freak flags of everyone's background is from architecture to, I mean, I'm a background engineering, I'm an, a marketing girl now, and um, just the same p architects are doing applications engineering and kind of, and some people don't have, um, they have their highest degree is high school and they're on the engineering build team. So the, it's really emulated from, the core of who Form Labs is. That's where I said that community was built before I like I took it over. It wasn't something new to start, but just to formalize. But then to formalize, we're like, okay, we have a bunch of fans. We never ask them to do anything. We don't even ask them a question on social, which was kind of funny. We we're just like thought it should be authentically growing. But you need a voice. You need to. You need a leader. You know, in groups, even in a, a passive leader, you need um, someone to kind of heard. So that's when we hired a social media specialist. That's when I had a technical community manager and a, a community manager who runs our forums. And we started formalizing stuff. And so formalizing stuff now means one-to-one -one relationships that started out of learning then became, oh, can we tell, talk about what you did on our blog? And then two years ago, um, a, little, a little over two years ago, we had this good idea of uh, creating, bringing a bunch of users together to celebrate a new launch of products. So then we created our first user summit, and they said, "Diana, give it a try, because you talk, you work with the tech partners, you work with like the software and hardware companies, and also the users. You know who should be in the room and who should talk, and then you can figure out the chairs and food and stuff." I was like, I <laughs> "Made a dinner party? I don't know more than that, but that happened and it went really well, and we sold out." And, the, con the, the topics resonated with people, and the bringing together of people resonated with people, and that's what mattered, and so we said, let's do it again somehow. So then we've taken that to road shows and like meeting, meeting people where they are, and we did one in Parsons in New York, and in Microsoft in San Francisco, and um, this really cool incubator called M-Hub in Chicago, going to where people are at, and, um, and bringing the user summit back, obviously, last year. Um, so that was like the gathering of, like formal gatherings of people has been really critical to get the conversation, also be a fly on the wall, to know what our community is saying. Right. And then, because digital behavior is also different than in person, and they're both valuable but different. And then the other piece of that, we're building out an ambassador program, which of course, <laughs> you and Jocelyn are part of, and we can always looking for more. And, um, we're also building out a community spaces program where we're formalizing our relationships with communities so we can scale, so we can do it again, so we can do it more. That's really cool. And I feel like one important thing that uh, I, I've seen on social media that you guys do, uh, one important part of community building, like I referenced in the beginning, is staying close to your why, right? That's like a big, uh, that's like a big thing, not only in 3D printing, just as you embark on your careers. It's staying close to your why. That's why I love the Women in 3D Printing Happy Hours is because we get to engage at that 
first level that got us interested in the first place. And you guys, don't you have a hackathon every year? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like business stops. <laughs> that that's so wait, non-technical people do this hackathon? Yeah. I like people made like planters out of our printers, um, <laughs> plushies, uh <laughs> Beautiful leather coasters, uh, rock climbing wall. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And and you guys have a sense of humor too <laughs> on social media. Everyone's really weird. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That all your employees, not only the technical people, really stay close to their why and really try their best to to stay in the same mindset as your customers. So it's it enables you to have yeah. these conversations and pull it out. Yeah, I mean, where's Liz? Uh, yeah, Liz is and was a customer of ours, and now she works at Form Lab, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so going along with like the specific tactics that you've kind of implemented and that you touched on, um, what are some programs you have implemented at Form Labs to really promote community, and how has the response been? Yeah, so yeah, as I mentioned a little bit, ambassador program, which means super users. We said like we talk to people and think their application is really cool, and in 3D printing, Everything is kind of new, and especially we have a, uh, I, I say a responsibility to understand what our users are doing with our machines, because we're giving them earlier access. It's like if you're giving access to, I don't know, this is weird, alcohol to a younger person, what are they doing with that? What's the outcome? But <laughs> it's, yeah, enter at your own risk, yeah. but for 3D printing, it's cheaper and easier to use. They have the access to do it. What are they making with it? And what new workflows are they defining? What can we learn from them? And how can we share that with other people? So that was us building a bunch of, like, literally an Excel sheet of special, we called super users who were doing cool stuff. And then we were tracking, for form a business perspective, like, what materials are they using? Because now we have 20 materials. And where do they live? Because maybe we'll be in their city. And literally, like, we've been to a trade show and we forgot a resin tank and we call them up and they drop off a tank and then we were like thanks you can have the extra resin when we're done with the show and like you know those one and one and one like literally a group of friends and then it's grown to now we have 350 lines of that and um we've designated them then we like the creme de la creme is where we said let's make an ambassador program let's really formalize it the people we keep asking to do stuff with because they're awesome um that was a really organic um Recollaboration, we created a program to really celebrate people that emulate who we think should use our stuff, um, and and can help teach people about three D printing. So so that's been I don't know how is it going? How is it? I mean, you're an ambassador of like many <laughs> brands. <laughs> just just two. Okay, just. <laughs> Um, what do you like about it, or what what opportunities does it bring you? And should I be an ambassador of something? Should we be looking for ambassadorships? Absolutely. <laughs> and how do you do that? I think it's like a win-win situation. I mean, again, referencing the beauty industry that is like genius with their marketing, you see a ton of ambassadors and influencers for all these brands. I mean, I think you guys are really one of the first to really implement that in the three D printing and make it cool and not, not only geeky, you know, not only technical, but just really cool and really proud to be a part of it. I've personally, in my experience, I think it's very beneficial for both parties. I mean, running a service bureau, we see a lot. We see a lot of weird requests. We turn down a lot of weird requests. We get these different uses for these different materials. We, we know what the strengths and weaknesses are of all of your materials. Um, and you know, being having that not only just loving form labs, but having that extra motivation to do things and showcase them is really smart. And you know, we drink resin, like we literally just drink resin on a monthly basis. <laughs> so if I can get like a free cartridge, it's I'm just like what do I have to do? <laughs> yeah, the most important thing that we're doing is just trying to navigate what the incentive is and it's based on our own constraints and business models it's not about dollar exchange as it is in kind and actually that's to me what makes a partnership is like i use when we're not doing trade show stuff it's like low dollars and lots of time and resources and like how can we enable the person to do more of what they want to do and like find what their needs are and your needs are and that's any venn diagram and community um co collaboration in general but but i'm just fascinated what it takes to like be an ambassador or, you know, yeah. what the, like, is that scary? <laughs> not, not really, because it's 
what we've already been doing, and it's just about putting it out to the world now. You know what I mean? Like showcasing it a little bit more, publicizing it a little bit more, talking about it a little bit more. So that part can be a little scary if, if you're not used to that. But for us, being that we, we are in front of customers so often, it, it was a natural step. Do you have recommendations for people who could, might be an ambassador? You know, we all have coveted brands of stuff that we love to use. Is there, do you have any tips for us to think about as an opportunity that we're missing? I think, I think you guys are doing a pretty good job, to be honest. Like, you guys are incorporating not only social, um, not only, like, internal ask me anything like we did, which was really useful for you guys, but also for me, because it gives, anytime I, I talk about the business from a higher level, it's like I gain some more perspective. I think about it through the eyes of who I'm talking to. Um, and also, the ambassadors are, are involved with live events as well and one-to-one -one events. So I think you guys really covered the gamut of everything you can do in terms of interaction okay. and community. We're learning. Thanks. <laughs> Y'all did like a great job. I model after the beauty industry and fashion because they're way more advanced than geeky 3D printing space. Yeah. They're amazing. Like, I always draw inspiration from them. It's, yeah. That's so cool. Um, so talking a lot about, like, growth in communities, kind of flipping the narrative a little bit, like, what, what do you think stifles growth in communities? Like, what, and, and how do you think we can get work past those things? Anxiety, for sure. We all shared that, and that's a fact. And it's, I said I was nervous to send a note to Jocelyn through Instagram, and I was, like, at night, like, looking through Forum Labs, like, on, on the Instagram account, I have, like, a password that people don't know I do, and, like, <laughs> sometimes I reach out. It's like, I don't know, I was just, what would I say if she said something back? But I'm just like, yeah. So, but I guess like online dating, it's easier digitally than in person. So that was something that like, so the anxiety of that, there's then there's tools and mechanisms like Insta and otherwise, Twitter or whatever. Um, so that's the behavioral side of, you know, making a practice of, you know, making goals and kind of trying to face a fear a little bit. You don't have to like throw yourself out of a huge comfort zone. Um, and then selfishness. I think also, and, and in a weird, almost people might even think they're being, well, two sides of that, but I think it's even through hum humility, people might think that like timid or shy to, to, to share what they love or what they're interested in and might not think that matters to other people, but it does. And it's actually helpful and get like your information is someone else's gold, literally. And I, I would been in the audiences before where I'm afraid to ask a question because everyone else's question is better than mine and a startup thing or a 3D printing thing. But everyone has their own thing to give in. And so that I would say selfishness could also be timidness as well. But the, the other side is just not, it's not community for like not giving and taking. I think that's a super valid point because I feel like sometimes you feel something as as just an audience member or someone at a networking group, like you feel it and you want to ask it, but you're like, oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, it's a stupid question. Oh, they get this all the time. And you, you kind of wave yourself off. But I think just taking that step of just putting it out there is super important and it, it changes everything. But also, especially in the industry of 3D printing, we are such a small community that is still just getting started. There's a lot of competition. Um, and I feel like there's, what I've noticed is that there's two different perspectives of community in 3D printing. It's either like, let's go for it. Um, I don't care if you're kind of a competitor. I think it would be really cool to connect and see what happens later on. Or uh, no, I don't want to talk to you. You're going to find out something about me and I'm going to go down. <laughs> How like, what, what do you think about all of that? I think competition is dumb. <laughs> and, I mean, I think it's a fuel, which is, I think it's healthy, but to use that, I mean, and it's real, so I want to say it, it's, it's, it's so human to feel threatened. But um, relating back to my twinship, when we were younger, people used to compare us, and who's a fat, we did sports and music and all that stuff, and like, who's a faster runner? Who weighs more? Who's smarter? And we decided to be on the same team, and we're like, she's better, you know? And I think so, uh, luckily, we were trained early to think about that type of thing, and we literally raise each other up from there. Um, Julie does something, like, you know, I, expo I, I put more time into 3D printing, I teach her, and she puts more time into so sustainability and social impact, and I, I learned from her. 
Um, she signed me up for a half marathon, <laughs> and, I had to, and I had to do I it. I like, she could have done it, or whatever. Um, if she can do it, I can do it. But it's really about, yeah, that basically, could you say, just um, being taking away the comp competition and saying we're in it together. Um, if you think about work and colleagues, right? Like, there's every there's a finite amount of. Um, pay that the company can give everybody and if you don't have direct counterparts you have indirect counterparts that could you know battle for the next role and you I mean it's up to you to choose your collaboration and journeys but if you bring your unique self to the story to the table to the project there's a thing something a little bit different to come out of it you know and you will stand on your own you're not going to be directly compared I completely agree. I think a lot of uh, the fear of competition and, and collaborating with competition comes from an insecurity of not really knowing your core. Because at the end of the day, we're all different people. Yes, we all work in the same industry, but we all have very different skill sets and different backgrounds and different specific niches that I think combined together can really make one beautiful like community that shares, really. Yeah, so that's the generosity thing. And I think yeah. that the person who's generous wins, usually. I mean, you have to take care of yourself, for sure. But sharing information, like you hear, I was always going to meetups for startups and stuff like that in the tech space. And they always said, if you want to be innovative, take an idea and do it faster and better. And, you know, go, and then there's always be like the token person in the audience to be like, I have a question, but I can't tell you about my business model. Um, but say I wanted to get funding for it, you know. Yeah. Like, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, if you have an idea and you want to protect it, that's totally valid. But no one knows that idea as much as, as well as you do, right? And so you're always automatically 10 steps ahead of your competitor. So sharing a little isn't, isn't giving it all away because it's in your head. You got to trust your gut. Um, so... Moving forward, um, it's hard to connect. It's hard to attend events. It's hard to build communities these days when, uh, especially when it's cold out, it's winter, you don't want to go out. You'd rather just like kind of order some Chinese and like sit home and watch your favorite net Netflix show. Um, so I want to ask the audience for, audience for the third question. How do you guys connect? Where do you connect? Um, what works for you? I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what people write down from different backgrounds. So take a minute. What's the weirdest like meetup or something you attended? I went to a general uh, networking, creative business networking event that was like in a dark bar. And it honestly felt like more like a a speed dating scene. Like everyone got a little 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 tipsy and you know, it was just weird. Like I thought I, I was like going dating to, dating. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know, you get hit on and it felt weird. And I was there to hand out business cards, you know. <laughs> what about you? I've showed up to a couple where I was the only I was the only one. It was like me and the organizer. <laughs> and then I quietly tiptoe away. <laughs> That's really funny. One because... time it was like a spirituality one. It felt really weird. <laughs> so I didn't <laughs> talk to the organizer. <laughs> yeah. That's like actually how women in this New York chapter started out. I had like, <laughs> there was this one uh, one um, happy hour that I chose like the freaking wrong place. Like I'm expecting like seven people. You'd think I'd choose a big place that could fit like seven attendees plus my whole team, which we were, at the time we were like four. Um, so that's 11 people total. I chose the smallest place in like Greenwich Village. And uh, we were late, like by 30 minutes, because we were trying to find parking. But the only attendee actually became our project manager, which is actually Alyssa. <laughs> so kudos for sticking Amazing. it out. <laughs> it's you, quality, not quantity. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. But it's so intimidating. I would have, if I was Alyssa, I would have quietly snuck out, yeah. you know? But she stuck through, man. <laughs> Funny story. Um, okay, so Diana, turning the question to you, like how how do you connect? How how do you find out about about 
different events. You, you've held so many positions. You've been a business, you are a business owner. You've worked as the lead of a team, of a six person team, you told me. You've been a marketing director. All these are very different positions. How do you, how do you like find events that suit you? Ooh, yeah, I just can't, like, literally, then, I have a couple newsletters. There's like one in New York called Gary's Guide and he does all the tech stuff and I like comb them all the time. Even when I'm living in Boston, I still comb them for New York. I have my go-to for Boston. I, when I lived in Berlin, I did the same and I think part of it was, first it was like being a new kid when once I graduated university, then I lived in Brazil and Germany and a couple other countries and so it was always new and trying to figure out what was a topic that might bring people similar to me together. And so I was just kind of used to like meetup.com, like when, especially in, I, I don't know, six years ago or so, I was in Berlin. And that's where I really got into the tech scene and the startup scene there and the 3D printing thing. And they had meetup and they had tech meetup things. And that's when I really got comfortable. And people kept asking me about um, things that I was going to because I was talking about them and meeting friends and making friends there and learning stuff that I ended up making like a little dinky website that isn't even doesn't exist anymore even but like <laughs> it was like the best place to go like the best that my recommendations for the meetups that were worth it and the ones that weren't worth it and and the cafes that had like plugins for your laptop and where people like huddle and stuff so I was kind of like doing that informally um but digitally is where they like all the information comes you like can go really quickly in Google. I'm, I always still like always look like Boston 3D printing or like Control F or whatever for like looking for 3D printing buzzwords because I still care about that um, outside of work too um, or silversmithing or whatever uh, the topic is that I'm looking for in any like consolidated information. Um, but event between Eventbrite and Meetup, those are all the informal things that there's no reason that people can't make an event like that anymore. So it becomes the Google for a gathering. And then, of course, all the forums and all that other stuff that is just ongoing, but I really thrive. I'm really bad at forums and kind of digital communication. It's not my strong point. I really thrive in IRL. So, <laughs> so that's what my go-to is. And then sharing that with others. If I can bring someone, that's awesome. And then I usually get more out of it anyways. Yeah. So That makes sense. That makes sense. Just having What are your go-to's? Uh... I, some is on Instagram, like I have specific like business influencers like in that space that are all doing their own thing, probably somewhere in the long lines of like Girl Boss or like uh, one of those communities or Create and Cultivate and I just kind of find out about stuff. Meetup was one that I frequented often but these days I, I just don't have as much time. Um, Eventbrite was usually good to find like maybe a not too expensive like paid event, um, yeah. Any other ones you guys are looking at these days? Facebook, oh yeah, for sure, yeah. That's true, oh, okay. The events tab is like super. Yeah, if, when people don't use it for anything else, they use it for the events. That's, that's true. Legit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh, that's, a good, <laughs> that's a good one, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, and sort of continuing on that theme, like how do you actually make it out the door? <laughs> I, I mean, usually it's, it's a great question. Um, usually out of isolation. <laughs> when I was new to Boston, I didn't know anybody. It would be a better excuse to show up somewhere. Um, or out of the, the fuel of the passion of 3D printing or jewelry at the time of um, whatever I was really wanting to get into. So one is motivation of the, yeah, Fear of isolation and then the passion fueling thing. And then, yeah, it was basically that because I had tasted something that tasted good the last time. I remind myself, well, last time when you went, you met this person. Like, I'd never had, I realized that I literally never had a regret when I went somewhere. Even the funny story of the programmers in the weird thing, it was like, helped <laughs> me want to figure out 3D printing just even more or like, you know, create a community around it. So I never literally regretted it. I only regretted it if I wasn't participating in the in the event, actually. If I didn't try and make more of it when I showed up. Mm. Has there, and there ever been like a moment where you're like about to head out the door and you sit on your couch and you're like, oh, this is comfy. For sure. There's a, <laughs> a lot of events that I probably could have really like gotten a lot out of that I didn't end up showing up to. And then those are probably like micro regrets that I like forgot about, but 
but I always remember the ones that I did, and right. they're always serving some for something. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, like, don't like time is precious. And I remember I came to New York with some dumb app idea. I like, moved from Berlin here, and, <laughs> and it was kind of an excuse to get to know the t the startup scene. And the startup scene, there was a bunch of BS around big ideas and launching companies that didn't exist and couldn't share your concepts. And that's when I was like, time to pivot. This isn't for me. And that's when I ended up joining that company as a marketing director for this pet food company. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, don't force yourself if it doesn't feel right. And that's when I started to say, this is not value added. I'm not going to spend my time. I've learned enough. Like, I've learned enough here. I've met enough people here. It doesn't feel totally like my people, but I also got enough information out. So, Gotcha. And going with the theme of anxiety again, which is something that we've all like experienced walking into a room full of strangers, like I, I experience that, that on, a, on a great level, even at my own happy hours that I host, and I see who's coming, and maybe I'll do some research, I still get anxiety, like, uh, like uh, what do I talk about? <laughs> how, how do you deal with that, and how, how do you like, get past that? Yeah, it doesn't really go away. I mean, even if I'm, I like to talk to people and meet new people and I'm still nervous and feel awkward to introduce myself. Um, so I make some goals and they're, well, one is to show up and then one is to like make the most out of showing up, which is like talking to one person. Mm. Like if you go, you have to talk to one person. Mm. And I usually like it, sometimes I wait till the very last minute. I've done it before in the elevator out the door with my head held low and then I was like, I'm gonna do it. And then I had a great conversation. But having that personal metric means I'm gonna get something out of it. Or because community really is two way. And if I showed up and listen to someone talk that's just a lecture and I'm a student, which is great. I learn stuff, but then I'm not, if I, like, I remember going to like, in the Salesforce building in Boston, there was a women's breakfast, like women in leadership breakfast. I don't know anyone there, kind of random that I was going to the Salesforce thing. I don't, I mean, I used the tool, but it wasn't like on the account name or whatever. And I went and I didn't really feel like I fit in somehow, I just didn't feel the vibe. And that's when I talked to the lady in the elevator. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had a great conversation and we exchanged cards and met someone else on the, on the way out too, because we were talking, someone else came over. Right. But the goal was, I'm like, that information wasn't even valuable. It was just talking about being a woman and work and that's not new. So I was like, I didn't get any valuable information and I didn't meet anyone. What a waste of time. Damn it, I have to talk to this girl. <laughs> and then I did and it was good. But that's my baseline metric. Um, nice. Another goal is sharing who you are in any way you can. Um, if, it's, if you're a jewelry designer, wear your jewelry. <laughs> Liz, Jocelyn, Julie, yeah, we know that. Um, the same thing if you like love a brand or a band, you're like, if you wear the t-shirt, people like respond to be like, they're Ramones or whatever. I go to University of Michigan and I think it's like the most widely sold like apparel and so everyone says like, go blue. Um, <laughs> but an event, um, I'd say, I mean, I'm kind of a physical person and I do get um, entertained by visuals and wearing stuff. So represent yourself. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be by the way you wear something, but maybe it's what you're holding. Maybe bring a 3D print if you want to talk about 3D printing. Um, other ways that I found have been really effective accidentally is when I ask a question, mm. then, and I like say what I'm interested in or by uh, introducing myself, people come up to me after to ask because I was like, oh, you asked the 3D printing question. Right. And so you yeah, obviously want to make something relevant to the conversation, but I recognize that when you say what you're interested in, is that like when you're you, yeah. then people who also share that centered Venn diagram thing are gonna also be like, great, someone else like me, cool, I have a question or a comment, yeah. or just an icebreaker then. Yeah. And interestingly enough, going back to like that first step of putting yourself out there, I feel like a lot of the fear is that you think no one will relate to you. Statistically speaking, how many humans are on this earth? Like, there's got to be like at least, you know, even a small percentage means a hand, like a lot of people that will relate to you. And chances are that person is in that room with you. So, but like you wouldn't know if you didn't just like kind of say an interesting fact and you know steer the conversation towards that for a minute, you know? 
Yeah, but it's scary even to say that, to start to say anything about yourself. It really is. Like, there's always this fear of, like, judgment, you know, and just, I don't know, putting yourself out there is just always vulnerable, right? But, but that's even why, like, a topic like 3D printing is, like, a fake... It's not a fake, but it's, like, the theme of something that you end up talking about. Yeah. Um, blue jeans, or we work, or <laughs> transportation, or politics, and it's just, oh, we share some set of common values. We can talk about that, cool. Even if we don't know what else to talk about, we'll talk about that. Yeah. But we can talk about a bunch of other things, and now I, I know the context or respect your opinion a little bit more because we share this little thing together. Yeah, exactly, and yeah, very well said. Um, so to wrap it up, I'd like to invite the audience to participate in the last like little post-it thing. Um, what are three pieces of, of advice that you'd give to someone who wants to be more active in their community? And super short, super short, but I'll give you a minute. What's the weirdest group you've been part of, like along your, like maybe when you're growing up or? Uh, my mom put me in chess classes <laughs> <laughs> as a middle schooler and I hated it. <laughs> I don't think I connected to anyone, but, and I don't think I even like chess. I think she just wanted to put me in something. <laughs> and I think I gave a lot of attitude because <laughs> I didn't want to be there. <laughs> what about you? Besides the programmer basement. Yeah. I went to fiddle camp. <laughs> <laughs> Band camp too, which was orchestra camp, which was cool, by the way. But yeah, okay. fiddle camp somehow, even though everyone loves to hear country bluegrass music, I grew up playing classical music, and I love pop and rock and all that other stuff, but, and I'm not against that music. I just didn't fit in, and I, it, was, it was a weird couple of days. <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, what else? I feel like... Any weird clubs people were part of? You want to fess up? <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> part of the bowling club in high school. <laughs> that was the isolation, desperation thing. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, so shooting the question back to you, Diana, uh, and, and kind of changing a little bit, what are your three pieces of advice for someone looking to follow in like a similar career path? Hmm. Well, I guess in anything, not even, it, to think about even your career path is just start small, start with some simple, should I say, start simple, start with what your truth is, what you know it to be. If you love 3D printing, if you love FDM 3D printing, start there. If you love Greenpoint, start there. If you love, um, if you want to be a director of anything, think about that. Just conceptualize that as you know the core of what you're interested in. Um, the the second part of advice would be, and this is like what I related to community build, community building is find your super users, mm. find your heroes of. Who, the, who operates in that space, mm -hmm. the ones that have the glory stories and the war stories, or the ones along the way. Um, I met someone named Lisa today. Lisa, are you still here? Yes, right there, behind my sister. Um, she has carved her path in 3D printing. She's printed with Forma Printer with Christina and learned how to cast it with a casting company. And... Um, as giving it as gifts and selling it to people as well. She started with an essence of jewelry, but she learned this crazy journey because she was doing that in software in the 80s. And so you followed that same exact path, but that core right now has been jewelry, and you're like, I want jewelry, I'm gonna figure it out. So she's just like, um, but I would say then, you guys, she's then our hero, super user for 3D printing, um, and well, I guess just paving her way in tech because you figured things out. So talk to people who figured things out and who can also celebrate with like, if you're the one who wants to build the community, then super users like you, like Jocelyn, like Liz, like other people here are the ones that are gonna help advocate for you too. Um, 
And the last one is just be you, be your passion. Your passion leads everything. Like when you're, it sounds cliche, but it's so true. If you're, first it, you know, you expo expose it so people know, you know, you're the 3D printing person. You're the, uh, I don't know, what, do you, what else are you interested in? Oh, F, what's it called, F, F45? F45. You're the F45 <laughs> workout person. I know that about you now because you share that with the world. Right. And then I'm sure people will reach out to you to say, you know, pick yeah. your brain and ask you stuff, right? Sometimes. And, yeah. So if that's the case, I mean, share that with the world and then people, you'll start bringing more dialogues. And like literally, if you believe in like the secret or something just way more tangible, stuff comes to you because you've put it out there because... You've educated people so someone, someone is reacting to something. And that will also both keep you up at night, but also wake you up in the morning for motivation. Because what else is, what's worth it in life if you're not excited to get out of bed for something? And that's not every day. And I don't feel like excited to get out of bed every day. But <laughs> with a couple core passions in my pocket, that stuff starts to like, you know, that's what I go through that list when I don't want to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> I, I feel that 100 percent I uh earlier in my career after I graduated college like I didn't I didn't necessarily feel feel that fire and like I didn't believe it because I was like this doesn't exist like I looked at the at my coworkers around me and I was like nah this doesn't exist like I, I don't see it um but when you find it you find it and then it takes over and it grows into this whole other thing and then you're like I don't know who I was without it and it's really interesting so that's like a great piece of advice but I feel like that fire comes with just trying and not forcing something, like letting yourself try try a little bit. I wouldn't dare feel say I was passionate about 3D printing when I didn't know that much about it. Right. And I was stumbling my way through learning a bit. Right. And when I could talk about it a little bit more is when I started recognizing that thing. Right. So that's an example of like, I didn't wake up one day like, I'm passionate about 3D printing. I just, it was a fascination that I followed that, that's so true. It goes with what you were saying as like your first one, like start simple, start a little bit small, take baby steps, gauge your interest, see if you want to go back. If you want to go back, then that's a start. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Really, really cool. So give a hand to Diana. <laughs> and Christina. Stop. <laughs> So again, I want everyone's goal to make at least one friend, one connection tonight. I, there are boards to our left. Um, your post-its are all color coordinated with your name tags and the boards and the questions. I invite you guys Amazing. to... <laughs> I'm, I like organization and color coding. <laughs> Um, I invite you guys to pin up your responses. I'm, I'm like super interested to see like the, the difference in response between like a designer versus like an engineer versus someone in sales versus someone in marketing or a business owner. And I think that's really valu valuable information for all of us to share. Um, so again, thank you for coming out tonight. I wanna again thank our sponsors, Formlabs, ADO, uh, and Topology. 3dprint.com, Core 77, People and Company, SimQuest, and Make Lab. And we have about like an hour, hour and a half left to grab a drink, grab some food, talk to some people, and put your stuff up on the board. Thank you.